Uh, it's 3 o'clock, and we have 34 witnesses we want to hear from in an hour and a half. And uh, actually, the, we've discovered that a shorter message is often more powerful and holds the attention of the listener better. So we're going to test that theory today. Um, and we're going to be talking about the governor's budget. And for those of you who are interested in Minnesota care and, uh, and uh, what happens in uh, medical assistance health care at hospitals, this is not the right meeting for you. Uh, <laughs> and so th that may come up tangentially. Uh, but this is about the four areas that are, that are our topic in particular. And I'll give you some exceptions about where you can weave in other thoughts. But uh, committee supports, uh, children family services, long-term care, and direct care and treatment uh, elements of the governor's budget are germane to this discussion. And things that are tangential. Um, you know, the, so, and just so you know, the governor funds all the stuff in his bill, $282 million with health care access fund money. So that would be a germane comment if you wish to decide that's a good or a bad idea. Um, and I just want to offer you, a, since there's a pretty good crowd attending this compared to other meetings where we've been doing overviews, I have no idea what the future holds uh, for our budget and our targets. Uh, I do know the governor did not spend any real money, a general fund, in this budget. So that should make you a little nervous. Uh, he refinanced health care access fund and conjured uh, the $282 million that he suggests that we would invest. And so just bear that in mind. Uh, that being said, I, you know my interest in preserving all the important services and the essential ones and moving us into the future in a way that's sustainable. Um, as we go into our discussions, I want to remind you again what a cut is and what a cut is not. If you have money in your pocket and I take money from you, that's a cut. If you're hoping to get money and it doesn't quite all come, that's actually still more than you had. And so how do we make the billion dollars that's going to be more than last time in this area go a little further and, and do more work for the people we so much care about? That's my challenge to you uh, as an audience and to the, the members here. Um, the, uh, just to also cheer you up, uh, the federal deficit is some $20 trillion, which by the way, it's actually 19.9 something, which by the way is a lot of money. If you take Minnesota's share of that, it's $20 billion, excuse me, $40 billion, $40 billion that they've given us that they borrowed. And so the actions in Washington that are going to come are going to reflect people's concerns about that. I have no idea how that works either, and it's my commitment and my passion to assure that as the changes come, that we handle them in the best possible way. And making the money we have go as far as it possibly can, like we're doing in the zero to five work group, which is tomorrow at uh, nine o'clock in room 2308 again, trying to make those programs function better. Not to save money, but to serve better uh, is part of that effort. And so we're all in this together. And uh, by the way, we uh, do have a timer. Hello, Cole. And, uh, there's nothing we'll throw at you, but uh, we will remind you to please uh, try to stay at two and a half minutes. And uh, with that, um, I'd like to welcome our first testifier. And just so you know how this works, uh, we have a list. Of, if you all have the little list, you'll see there's a person who's number two. That'd be the uh, Miss Sales. And so if she sat in the chair next to Mr. Griffin, that'd be awesome. And then when, when Miss Prey gets done, then if Mr. Elwood would come sit, and we'll kind of just go like that and, and touch on on transit time. But I don't want to have you take away from the impact of your talk. I just want to take away from the impact of wasting transit time. And uh, if you didn't get to say all you wanted to, uh, write it down and we'll read it. And uh, there's a number of items in the uh, folders that are now. So anyway, uh, does that seem like fair ground rules? Ms. Prey, welcome to the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Abler and members of the committee for the opportunity to uh, testify with you here today. So as Senator Abler said, my name is Cheryl Prey and I'm CEO of the Association of Residential Resources in Minnesota. It's an association of more than 200 members across Minnesota that serve people with, uh, people with disabilities. Our members directly or indirectly support tens of thousands of Minnesotans and employ more than 100,000 people. So during the first six months in my position, I've had the opportunity to meet and speak with providers from across the state that support people with disabilities in intermediate care facilities, group homes, and apartments, all with the same vision and goal of supporting people in the most um, accommodating way through person-centered planning. I'm here to today to tell you that the governor's budget, it offers some positive ideas to assist people, but it misses and fails to address the most 
pressing issue for achieving our goal, and that's the immediate need for a strong and stable workforce. I'd like to share some statistics with you. As business people, uh, they may send chills down the spine of any of you that have owned or operated a business. At the end of 2015, providers in Minnesota reported that more than 8,700 job vacancies are currently in existence, with a staff turnover rate of 60%. These vacancies have resulted in a 65% increase in costs, one provider shared he paid 19,800 hours of overtime, and another shared an additional $800,000 on top of salaries already to cover overtime costs. The governor's budget proposes a study to analyze the workforce and collect data to pay on pay, benefits, and staff turnover at a cost of $3.3 million. I have a solution for you. Members of the committee, I cannot stress enough that we do not have time on our side. Providers will close before this study is complete. And if we do not address this workforce crisis today, pr providers will close. So ARM has the data, and we are seeking that you are seeking, and I would be really happy to work with you. So I ask you to remember that if we wish to continue to live up our strong reputation of providing a supportive state, provides options to people with disabilities, please review the governor's proposal and your own legislative initiatives to avoid unfunded costs and mandates on providers, maintain the current planned investments in our system, and take immediate steps to address the workforce shortages by investing in higher wages for direct care staff. Thank you, Ms. Frey. It's harder than you think, isn't it? Yeah, thank Hello, you. Ms. Sales. Mr. Elwood, you're on deck. Hi, Senator Abler and members of the committee. My name is Laura Sales, and I work with, for the Minnesota Nurses Association. For those of you we haven't had a chance to visit yet, we're a union of about 20,000 bedside nurses who work primarily in hospitals all across the state and in Wisconsin and Iowa. We also have nurses who work in nursing homes and for the state of Minnesota, including about 400 nurses who work in the direct care and treatment programs at the Department of Human Services. Um, just so you know, we also have two MA members who are testifying later as part of a larger group of workers from the Minnesota Security Hospital who spent a lot of time and energy working with DHS and the Bureau of Mediation Services to construct the Minnesota Security Hospital staffing for improved client care and staff safety proposal in the governor's budget. <laughs> as you'll hear more from our nurses, this is one of the most important proposals for us. Um, it would increase the staffing because it would increase the staffing at the security hospital. Currently, the ratio of nurses to patients in the security hospital is below the average at comparable forensic psychiatric facilities in other states. This needed funding would increase staffing levels so that nurses and others can ensure that patients are receiving quality care at the same time that staff is working in a safe environment. Other proposals that we support include the proposal for the Minnesota State Operated Community Services Sustainability the direct care and treatment security system and electronic monitoring upgrade proposal, and the proposal to continue the lease at the Child and Adolescent Behavioral Health Services building. Uh, I also want to call attention to the proposal for the direct care and treatment system modernization. As the department has testified, about 80% of the client records in the DCT system are paper-based, so upgrading to electronic health records can help our nurses provide better care to their patients because they would be spending less time on paperwork and more time on care. Another important aspect of this proposal is that it would ensure that records uh, meet state and federal requirements, that all aspects of client records be available so a client can move through the treatment system and be discharged in a timely manner. So this by no means represents all that we support or have concerns with in the governor's budget, but given time constraints, I'm gonna leave it at that. I think that was perfect. Um, nurse is perfect, that's a redundant term. Um, Ms. Sanford, you're on deck, and Mr. Elwood, hello. Hello, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Ron Elwood with Legal Aid, um, and I guess since I can't be perfect, I'll be as best <laughs> as I can. Um, uh, I represent Legal Aid, and that includes the Minnesota Disability Law Center, of course, our statewide program that serves uh, persons with disabilities. Um, on the child care front, we'd like just to highlight some of the things we really strongly support, the portion of the governor's budget that provides funding to allow parents on transitional uh, year child care to stay in school. I think that creates better outcomes for everybody, and of course, including the children. Um, hoping that the committee also will build on the governor's proposal to put money into uh, making a meaningful reduction in the basic sliding fee um, waiting list. 
Um, for, uh, re with respect to services for persons with disabilities, the Disability Law Center supports many of the provisions, but highlighting just some, the new employment services, home and community-based waivers, of course, because they reduce the use of staff services and maximize people's independence. Uh, provisions increasing pay for PCA because we are keenly aware of the lack of staff and access to many essential services that uh, we really support these. Um, and the um, provisions for outpatient uh, mental health services, community mental health services, and funding for children's intensive mental health services. Finally, I would be remiss if I did not express our deep disappointment that the governor did not include any increase to the families and children on the MFIP program. I will remind again, it's 31 years and counting, that the amount of the grant in 1986 is the same as it is today, and in 1986 that essentially covered your rent. Today, it covers half your rent. Unstable housing leads to especially bad outcomes for children and their performance in school, and I will remind you that there are 60,000 children on this program. The legislature, of course, has the opportunity to correct this problem, and I will only say it's time. Thank you. Thank you very much. 1986 is a long time ago. Um, Mr. Gustafson, you're on uh, DAC. Uh, Ms. Sanford, I haven't seen you for about an hour. Welcome. I know. I miss you. Thank you, Chair Abler, members. Thank you for this opportunity to address the governor's budget. My name is Claire Sanford. I represent the Minnesota Child Care Association. I'm also an employee of New Horizon Academy. I'd like to specifically address some of the Child Care Assistance Program, or CCAP, provisions in the budget. One main goal of what everyone's been hearing about, the federal reauthorization of the Child Care and Development Block Grant, which was passed overwhelmingly bipartisanly on the federal level, championed by Minnesota's own John Klein. Um, a huge part of that is to increase stability for children and families. And we're extremely pleased to see that many of the family-friendly provisions of eligibility are in the governor's budget, things like authorizing families for a full 12 months instead of six months, allowing for stable co-pays, an expedited process for homeless families and children, and more. Stability will be huge for these families, these children, the jobs they're trying to work, the education they're trying to get. And it will have positive spillover effects. For example, the early learning scholarship program that Minnesota funds for low-income three and four-year-olds, that money will go farther if CCAP is shored up. Because right now, CCAP fills a lot of holes, or scholarships, I'm sorry, fill a lot of holes that our current CCAP system doesn't cover. So if the CCAP program is improved, that early learning scholarship money can be used more efficiently and perhaps serve more children. We're also very grateful for the proposed reimbursement rate increase for CCAP providers. The program was gutted in budget cuts in 2013, not as far back as 1986, but it's been a long time. However, the governor's budget keeps current rates pegged to the 25th percentile and uses the 2016 child care provider market rate survey to set them. This is a step in the right direction, but does not go as far as the governor's budget last year, which was to the 50th percentile, which was quite bold and closer to the federal recommendation of the 75th percentile. CCDF, or I'm sorry, the Child Care Development Block Grant federal reforms require that states continually update their reimbursement rates based on based on more recent market surveys. And the governor's proposal pegs them to the 2016 survey, but doesn't start them until February of 2018. What we'd really like to see is the legislature have language that will automatically update these rates every time a market survey is done, because that is a federal requirement that it has to be done within a certain number of years. Otherwise, we have to keep coming back here and having this discussion every couple years. And unless the legislature acts affirmatively, it's too easy for our state to slip out of compliance with the federal law. Thank you very much. And thank you. And uh, Ms. Turner, you're on deck. Welcome, Mr. Gustafson. Thank you. Chair Abler and committee members, my name is Ben Gustafson. I work for Frazier. We're a nonprofit that serves 9,600 families throughout Minnesota. We're best known for being Minnesota's oldest and largest serv uh, autism service provider, although we serve children and adults with more than 110 different disabilities. The governor's proposed budget would impact our families in many ways, but I will limit my comments to four areas. First, the governor has recommended several changes to the disability waiver rate system known as DWRS. Many of the changes are technical. However, together, these changes would reduce state spending for disability waivers. Frazier is very concerned about disruptions to individuals once DWRS is fully implemented. 
Uh, as this committee reviews the proposal, we would ask that you carefully review any changes to ensure the best services are available to individuals on disability waivers. Second, Frazier is concerned with the proposed licensing fee increase for 245D providers, especially with likely revenue reductions for providers once DWRS is fully implemented and the current workforce concerns as Arm noted previously. Third, Fraser strongly supports the governor's recommendations on increasing independence and greater choice for individuals with disabilities. Uh, these include community living through the increased Minnesota Supplemental Aid Housing Assistance, referred to as MSA Housing Assistance, benefit and community employment through the new waiver employment services. Finally, we greatly appreciate the governor's targeted rate increase for mental health services. However, we're concerned that the separate proposed or a proposal requiring every mental health staff member to enroll with DHS will add significant overhead to providers. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Gustafson. And Mr. Larson and Mr. Rutson. Ms. Turner, welcome to the uh, committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Beverly Turner representing Catholic Charities. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, we are very supportive of the CCAP improvements in the governor's proposal and, and hope that you build on that by increasing program funding for CCAP. At Catholic Charities, we run and operate a Northside Child Development Center in northern Minneapolis, as well as operate the Ramsey County Emergency <coughs> Shelter for Families located in Maplewood. So we see firsthand in our clients how both CCAP and MFIC do affect our, our families. And one of the impacts, and I'm going to talk about the, a little bit about the cliff effect because this is addressed in the CCAP uh, program improvements, where families basically get stuck in these programs because they're afraid to take a job, uh, a raise, or take a new job and get more pay because the benefits that they will lose if they get their CCAP cut off right away, uh, the benefits they lose are more than they actually would earn in the increased or advanced job. So critical that these CCAP improvements are put into place to uh, assist with that as well. Um, on the MFIP front, we would also like to see an increase in MFIP. These families are living hand to mouth and they're not they're getting stuck in poverty. They are living in crisis situations where any unexpected expense uh, puts them in a tailspin, frankly. And additional f sources of income will help with getting them to focus on job training and helping them with career advancement. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And on deck, we have um, Ms. Ganella. Mr. Larson, Mr. Rutson, um, Mr. Gustin saved you 30 extra seconds, so you can do whatever you want with that time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In honor of you both being here. Hello, Chair and Committee members. My name is Kurt Rutson, and this is Steve Lawson with me. Um, I'd like to talk to you today about the governor's budget, what we maybe should do with those dollars. Um, the first thing I'd like to mention is employment for people with disabilities. Why are, why is employment important? Well, employment for me, I have a couple of jobs. I work with the Ark of Minnesota and I work at the New Vikings Stadium. And for people who, who don't have employment, I feel so horrible and so, so bad that they don't even have a reason to get up in the morning. And that helps a person like you would not believe. And like I, I always say, we can kick the can down the road farther if we like, and we can do that, but how long until the can falls off the road? And I want to um, encourage you and, um, uh, and, and ask you to support persons with disabilities in employment. We need to take care of these people, but they need some just extra help. 
like you all do also, and like we all do. So we need to take care of these people. And now I'd like to turn it over to Steve Lawson. In the 50 seconds left, Mr. Chair, <clears throat> I'll just reinforce what uh, Kurt said as far as employment. It's in the governor's budget, three new employment services. Uh, it'll help address the low employment rate for persons with disabilities. We also uh, really support the um, increase in Minnesota supplemental aid, housing assistance. As you know, the ARC Minnesota has helped uh, 1,800 people find places of their own with their name on the lease. We could be helping hundreds more uh, if we increase this housing assistance, so we're really looking forward to that. The governor also proposes to develop individualized budgets by 2021. Uh, this is part of our consumer-directed effort, uh, self-direction. Uh, we believe that we should be even breaking more barriers down to expanding consumer direction, so we will be working on legislation to address that by uh, creating a better budget process for individuals with disabilities. So along with that, uh, we certainly are active members of the Best Life Alliance and uh, encourage looking at the needs of our direct support professionals and the crisis that Minnesota currently is in. And we'll be back to talk more on our different uh, separate bills. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Thank you very much to both of you. Um, Ms. Krisnick, and uh, welcome, Ms. Ganella. Hi. My name is Pam Ganella, and I'm the parent of a 34-year-old daughter with disabilities. Our daughter, Sarah, suffered brain, severe brain damage from a viral infection when she was five years old. I'm also the chair of the Best Life Alliance. This is an alliance of parents, advocates, and over 130 service providers and we are seeking better compensation. Could you pull the mic a little closer? We don't want to okay. miss a word. I'm sorry. <laughs> we are seeking better compensation for direct care workers who support people with disabilities throughout our state. While the governor's budget included a wage increase for the PCA program, it did not include a wage increase for thousands of underpaid direct care workers across Minnesota. I am asking you to change this. Current direct care workers, their wages lag far behind workers in other businesses. Many potential employees simply choose to work someplace else where they could get paid more. Um, these are, there, this has created a workforce crisis and it also has made ongoing instability in the disability services around Minnesota. Um, the Department of Human Services last summer had a workforce summit. And there, one of the findings it had was that nearly 40% of the direct care workers live in households that rely on public assistance. Um, our daughter, Sarah, we cared for her at home for 25 years. And then she moved four years ago to a group home. At the group home, there are six people with severe disabilities. Um, there used to be three people um, of staff on each shift. Now it's gone down, the turnover has been just horrendous for the families. It seems like we're always saying goodbye to people. Um, but now there are only two people each staff, and that is the actual minimum that they can have in order to meet their licensing requirements and keep their, the house in operation. I pray that Sarah will be surrounded by people who love her and take good care of her when I'm not there to watch over her. This workforce force threatens her future, and it gives us parents a uh, a lot to worry about. So I want to thank you and Anne uh, for your time. Thank you. A blessing, Ms. Scanella. Thank you. And on deck, we have uh, Carrie Thurlow and Toby Pearson. And welcome, Ms. Krisnick. Thank you. I'm Ann Krisnick, the Executive Director of the Joint Religious Legislative Coalition, made up of the Minnesota Council of Churches, the Minnesota Catholic Conference, the Jewish Community Relations Council, and the Islamic Center of Minnesota. And jointly, our group represents over three quarters of the faith communities in Minnesota. There are a number of things in the budget that we believe make for a better Minnesota, and we support them, but we share the concern and the disappointment of a number of the people who have testified here today about the lack of an improvement in the Minnesota Family Investment Program. For those of you that um, may be newer to the committee or not as familiar with it, these are most often very low wage earners that um, are either between jobs or in some cases are working but aren't able to get enough work to be over the poverty line. So this is for a family of three, we're looking at an income of $20,160. Um, since 1986, that same family of three would have been eligible for $532 to pay for rent, transportation, diapers, medicine, toilet paper, soap, all of those basic supplies, and currently that's still $532, which is certainly not enough. 
Um, most of the recipients of the money under MFIP are children, seven out of 10. Half of those are children under five. And we know from our faith communities, you know from all of your work that poverty hurts children, it hurts families, it hurts communities, it really hurts our state. And what we are looking for is for this committee to increase the amount of that MFIP grant for the first time in 31 years. Um, our faith communities share a belief that we all need to work together for the common good, and we really need to take care of the poor among us. This is a case that we have people who are really struggling. Please make a grant to help these families and children so they can have basic stability while they work for financial success. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we now have the, oh, not the bookends anymore. Uh, Santa Leff is on deck. Welcome. Mr. Chair, members, my name is Toby Pearson. I'm here with Care Providers in Minnesota. Today is the long-term care imperative. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair. I'm Carrie Thurlow with Leading Age Minnesota, also here on behalf of the long-term care imperative. Uh, when we looked at the governor's budget, we examined the governor's budget to see if it's actually taking the next steps of reform and what goals or objectives should it be aimed at. Um, the goals that we'd like to offer are that seniors should live independently for as long as they're able with access to the services they need in the community they call home. We're entering an era where we have more seniors who will live longer than ever. We've all seen the demographics. Flexible community-based services are a critical part of a successful and affordable care strategy for Minnesota. Second goal, state of Minnesota should provide seniors and their families with the flexibility to choose the best options for care while continuing to encourage innovation, quality, and value-based decisions. We took a first big step in that in 2015 with the nursing facility reform. We'd like to see that translated over to elderly waiver as well. Finally, caregivers should receive the support they need to make older adult services a successful and stable career. Minnesota needs a workforce development and retention plan that supports today's caregivers in every corner of the state and recruits caregivers for tomorrow's needs. As we look at the governor's proposal, we see both possibilities and challenges, and Ms. Thurlow will walk through some of those. Uh, good afternoon again, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, we are going to just flag a couple of things that we see in the governor's budget that could potentially impact the seniors and the growing aging population in Minnesota. Um, until we see language of the specific bills that will be coming forward, um, I think we're going to have to look carefully at those and, and we'll work with the department to have some questions answered. But just want to flag for your information a couple of items. The first is a proposal for workforce data collection for all home and community-based service providers. Providers. Um, we uh, understand that there, uh, we are one of the groups raising concerns about workforce. Certainly we bring forward our own data. And we want to be sure that we work with the department to make sure that data collection is tailored to a specific goal and also not duplicative of other data collection efforts, particularly with data that we submit to DEED. Uh, the governor proposes implementation, uh, continued implementation of value-based reimbursement. Uh, many of those items we believe are consistent with items that we ourselves are going to be bringing forward forward, although there are probably a couple of details that we still need to work out. There are a number of fee increases to senior care providers, both uh, home and community-based service providers as well as care centers, um, to pay for a number of items in the governor's budget. We certainly are mindful of the duplicative effect of that and are, are, are concerned. Um, but we'll be particularly looking at the language as it looks to, um, and certainly support the goal of protecting vulnerable adults, but looking carefully at the language, both with the um, expansion of the Minnesota Adult Abuse Reporting Center, as well as expansion of OHFC. And then last but not least, the, um, uh, the assisted living consumer survey and report card that is in the governor's budget. We want to be mindful that we're having a conversation, that the report card is again, uh, the discussion that we're having is not just collecting data and information for information's sake, but really driving towards outcomes and incentivizing uh, the quality and performance expectations that we all have and share. So these are just some of the items that we're, we're watching for. We look forward to seeing specific language and, and working with the department on these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bachman and uh, Ms. Leff, uh, welcome. Yeah, you can sit wherever you like. Yeah. That's the best chair. So. <laughs> Mr. Chair, members, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Senta Leff and I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Coalition for the Homeless. 
I represent over 100 member organizations from every legislative district in the state. On behalf of our members and the poorest working families in Minnesota, I would like to address an issue that was not included in Governor Dayton's budget that you've already heard about today. The Minnesota Family Investment Program, or MFIPS, cash assistance has not increased in 31 years. Disappointment honestly does not begin to describe the reaction our coalition has um, to being overlooked after two years of bipartisan support, three years of historic government surpluses, and more than 30 years of stagnancy. More than 60,000 kids and their parents are accessing MFIP as we sit here right now, and they're struggling to meet their basic needs with an average of just $348 a month. Nearly 75% of Minnesotans accessing MFIP are kids, and in the vast majority of these cases, their parents utilize this time-limited cash assistance immediately after losing a low-wage job that did not provide traditional unemployment insurance. This is an unemployment insurance program. They're hard-working families. They've lost jobs in the hospitality industry, in temp jobs, in low-wage health care jobs, and they simply cannot find stable housing, afford gas to get to work, um, provide basic needs for their kids like diapers, and snow boots. And these kids are worthy investments, and I am one of them. My mom accessed MFIP temporarily when I was a young girl, and parents today receive the exact same basic MFIP cash assistance that she did more than 30 years ago. I don't believe that any of you here agree that any child in Minnesota should live with so little. And people accessing MFIP are in every community in all of your districts and their friends and neighbors, your constituents, are deeply concerned about the circumstances we're asking families and kids to live in. So I hope this committee will consider including an increase to MFIP as you propose and balance a budget for the upcoming biennium. Thank you for your time, Mr. Chair and the committee. Thank you, Ms. Leff. And uh, Ms. Schatz is already here on deck, so Mr. Bachman. Yes, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I'm Randall Bachman. I'm the chair of the Minnesota Consortium for Citizens with Disabilities, otherwise known as MNCCD. We are a broad-based coalition of 45 advocacy and provider organizations, as well as over 150 affiliated organizations and individuals active in our work groups. Together, we work to support public policies to improve the lives of people with disabilities through building awareness, providing education, and engaging the community. We thank Governor Dayton and the legislature for historic support of people with disabilities and look forward to carrying on the Minnesota tradition of innovation and accountability in taking care of our own. A heading in the disability section of the governor's budget is, quote, independent living, strengthened core services to provide choice, unquote. This concept aligns with our values and priorities, and we are pleased to see how we at CCD are working towards the same goals. With investments in disability services, Minnesota can go a long way towards transitioning more people to services that are the right size for them and diverting individuals from needing more intensive services in the first place. We are pleased to see one of our top priorities in the budget, Minnesota Supplemental Aid Housing Assistance, MSAHA, called Individual Community Living in the Governor's Budget on page 20. This provision increases the monthly support for housing costs for persons with disabilities in 2020 and changes eligibility so people can transition from group to residential settings like group homes to more independent housing. Through a, a waiver, it will also leverage federal reimbursement to pay for more housing and services that are currently state paid. We do have two priorities that aren't in the Governor's Budget the changes to consumer-directed community supports and also medical assistance spend down. So I'd like to thank the, um, well, together, we can truly work to, together with the governor and the legislature to assure more people with disabilities can participate in the community. Thank you for the work you do and thank you for listening to my testimony. 
Thank you, Mr. Bachman. Ms. Krinky. And I just want to comment. You, the people in the audience can't see the faces here, but it's really nice to see all the passion and good people that are bringing their concerns forward. So just want to mention that to all the audience. Ms. Krinky, you can come up. Thanks, Mr. Bachman. Ms. Schatz. Hi. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, for the opportunity to testify. My name is Susie Emmert Schatz. I'm from Lutheran Social Service of Minnesota. Um, LSS has a 151 year tradition in Minnesota of serving the neighbor. We have 2,300 staff statewide, and we provide services across the lifespan to one in 65 Minnesotans. Um, just a few highlights of areas that we are really pleased with in the governor's budget. Uh, the individual community living, page 20, also known as Minnesota Supplemental Aid Housing Assistance, is critical to people with disabilities who are paying over 40% of their income to housing costs and for individuals in GRH facilities so they may have more opportunity to move out of those facilities such as group homes into more independent settings. Another area under HCBS reform is the opportunity to work on individual budgeting, which is, in, is, critical, is critical for self-direction and employment services that will allow many more people with disabilities, especially young people who are at a critical age, to transition and work directly in the community and live directly in the community as well. All of these will contribute to that. Some other areas would be the extension of North Star to children under six who would provide which would provide equal benefits to foster parents who adopt. Also a 5% rate increase to mental health fee for service on page 107. Um, these services, these improvements go a long way to supporting our neighbors in Minnesota. A couple areas of concern would be the 245D licensing fee increase to home and community based services, especially without a rate increase in home and community based services um, to address the workforce crisis. That's on page 211. We have deep concerns about that. And then also the limit on billable days for residential services services to 350 days, which would greatly impact some of our work. So, um, and that is on page 33. Thank you so much, and we look forward to partnering with you um, this year. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Schatz and Ms. Krinke. We have a crowd of four that are going to testify together, so if you want to start working your way down, we'll get you a spare chair, and one of you can just queue up there somewhere. Ms. Krinke, welcome Great. to the committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Mary Krinke, and I'm with the Minnesota Hospital Association. My comments today will primarily focus, although not entirely, on the portions of the budget that are in the human services allocations and not in the health care allocations. There are two items in the direct care and treatment services area that I would like to specifically mention. The first is the child and adolescent behavioral health services, commonly known as CABS, and, uh, which is found on page 123 three of the budget documents. This facility is located in Wilmer and quite frankly it is out of date and has not been able to serve very many children. Um, the proposal will bring that capacity up to 16 children. We have heard from our hospitals and others that it is extremely difficult to find community placement for these very high need children. So we certainly think that the expansion of beds would be, would be a good thing. The second item I would like to mention is the proposal to reinvest county share in a community health infrastructure. As you all know, the counties right now pay $1,300 a day any time someone does not need the level of care that's considered hospital level of need care at Anoka and the community behavioral health hospitals. This is a proposal to use some of that money to go back to the counties in the form of grants. Um, the Hospital Association has been working on a similar approach, although it is bigger, using all of that money to go out into grants for mental health services. That is a bill that will be introduced separately, but I would like to say we do like that provision in the governor's budget. Um, in my remaining time, I would like to share just some of MHA's underlying concerns with the governor's budget. In this time of enormous budget uncertainty, we believe it is very unwise to use any of the resources in the Health Care Access Fund to, quote, refinance medical assistance, let alone help fund other areas of state expenditures which are outside of health care and health and human services, which is what the governor's budget does. There are 194,000 Minnesotans who currently receive their health care services and coverage in Medicaid and Medicaid expansion under the Affordable Care Act. Minnesota receives $1.6 billion a year to help pay for their health care coverage. This money, as well as money that Minnesota receives from our basic health plan, which has been part of our Minnesota Care program, is certainly at risk with likely repeal of the Affordable Care Act. These 194,000 Minnesotans will qualify for Minnesota Care. 
Minnesota Care goes up to 200% of the federal poverty guidelines. These individuals all make less than 138% of the federal poverty guidelines. They will all qualify for Minnesota Care. We will need every dollar that is in the Health Care Access Fund to help pay for their coverage. So we would urge legislators to please protect this money and use it for its intended purposes, which was to help pay for coverage for low-income Minnesotans. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Krenke. Now we have a group of four very distinguished uh, county individuals. Uh, and I think you're aggregating your time so you can mix and match and introduce yourselves. And thank you for being part of today's testimony. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the committee, my name is Todd Patzer. I'm a commissioner from Lackaparlo County, here representing the Association of Minnesota Counties. AMC is a statewide association representing all of Minnesota's 87 counties. As partners with the state in service delivery, we want to work with you to create systems that will allow the residents of Minnesota to receive the highest quality of service. Counties were disappointed that the governor did not include in his budget AMC's top HHS priority, investment into the METS system. As you know, counties are responsible for helping our residents determine eligibility for medical assistance, which is a role that will continue independent of the fate of Minsure. Counties are asking for an additional state investment of just over $10 million for the biennium to accelerate METS functionality. This investment will help counties to efficiently and accurately determine eligibility on a modern technology system that meets the needs of our residents. Without this investment, counties will be required to con continue to defer funds from other important services to keep up with the demands created by an inefficient system. Counties are already struggling under increased cost restraints. Cost shifts to counties for services at AMRTC and the CBHHs are crippling county budgets, specifically in rural areas. In total, counties are paying $24 million a year in cost shifts that are going into the general fund. Counties would prefer to see these punitive cost shifts removed. However, if these cost shares are to remain in place, counties were happy to see the governor reinvesting some of the cost shifts borne by counties to mental health grants to counties for system improvements. As counties continue to struggle to meet the increased costs for mental health, we oppose any additional cost shares or shifts that will negatively impact counties. The governor's budget calls for a cost share for people in the Minnesota sex offender program who are provisionally discharged back into the community. Individuals relieved from MSOP are committed to the Commissioner of Human Services. Counties should not be responsible for subsidizing state programs when we are struggling to meet our own needs. Counties have seen dramatic increases in the number of child protection reports statewide. These increased numbers have left counties significantly under-resourced in staffing, law enforcement, court services, foster care, and family services. Counties are struggling to stay ahead. We appreciate the governor's investment in child protection at the state level, but as counties continue to serve these families, we need appropriate services to ensure child safety. One way counties can support families is by supporting funding the governor proposes in home visiting. This is a positive first step, but as currently proposed, not all counties would benefit. We will continue to work with you and the advocacy community on funding this program in a way that will benefit all counties who serve families in need. Thank you for your time and attention to these matters. We look forward to continued conversations on these and other important issues as the session progresses. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hello. Chair, good afternoon, members of the committee. Good afternoon. My name is Pam Selvig, and I'm the Health and Human Services Director with Scott County, which is located in the Southwest Metro. I'm here today representing the Minnesota Association of County Social Service Administrators, or MAXA, and the Minnesota Intercounty Association, or MICA. Thank you for the opportunity to share just a few thoughts on the governor's proposed budget. Both MAXA and DeMica support the governor's proposed investments in children. We know Minnesota's Child Care Assistance Program, or CCAP, is in need of serious improvements, many of which you heard about today and are required at the federal level. We support the governor's investment in these improvements and hope that they will ultimately lead Minnesota down the road of being able to increase the capacity of CCAP to reach our state's most vulnerable children and families. We also support the governor's proposal to fully examine the best options to provide a continuum of care for children and adolescents struggling with mental health, as well as to support existing options with state funding while this continuum is being developed. As the governor proposed significant investments in technologies, county 
So we're hopeful that he would also support Minnesota's eligibility technology system, which is known as METS, um, which determines um, eligibility for medical assistance. Please note that this is a distinct function for MNSURE, and regardless of what the future holds for MNSURE, the state needs a functional, assist, functional system to process medical assistance. This technology infrastructure is critical for our 87 counties to make sure that Minnesotans are receiving the most appropriate benefits in a timely, cost-efficient manner. We are disappointed that the governor did not propose funding that is critical for maintaining the integrity of our public programs. The shifting of costs to the county level, um, as my colleague indicated, is a growing concern of MAXA and MICA, as we believe it erodes the tenets of our state's human services financing model, which is state-directed, county-administered, and could have alarming effects on clients, property taxpayers, and service delivery. We were glad to see that the governor recommends invest investing in some of the costs borne by counties for individuals at the Anoka Metro Regional Treatment Center and the Community <laughs> Behavioral Health Hospitals into mental health grants. We would like to see the legislature cons consider reinvesting more of this cost share. Statewide, this currently costs counties $24 million a year. We look forward to working with the governor, DHS, and this committee on ways to approach human services financing so that we are effectively making sure that maximum dollars are going to support and protect our state's most vulnerable ind individuals. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, we're not taking questions, but thank you. You've got about four minutes left to split, so it goes quicker than you think. So, Commissioner or whomever, okay. welcome. We're going to have to split four It's minutes. like a county budget. You just have to stretch it further and further. Well, I know you've chopped it out of yours. Should I go just real fast? Okay. Tell us the cool stuff we haven't heard yet. How's that? <laughs> uh, Mr. Chair, I'm Linda Higgins. I'm a Hennepin County Commissioner. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Um, this is a solid budget that makes uh, necessary investments in human services infrastructure and, more importantly, in our people. Um, in my limited time, I want to call uh, your attention to a couple of items that are a great concern to Hennepin County. And if there's any time left, I'll tell you what items we really appreciate. Um, for the second cycle in the row, the budget calls for cost share uh, by counties for people in the Minnesota sex offender program who are provisionally discharged back to the community. More specifically, the budget calls for counties to, to pay 25% of the cost of services. We oppose this cost shift. I want to remind the committee and the entire legislature that these people are still committed to the care and supervision of the state, to the Commissioner of Human Services. All the cost, all the cost of their supervision and care should be borne by the state, not by counties. Counties have no say in their placement. We have no say in their treatment protocols. We should not have to underwrite the cost of a state program that we have no role in. And uh, you've already heard about the METS system problems. I'll just say um, times three yeah. on that one. Uh, it is really important. But also let me remind you that last year you passed um, uh, a provision to require the state to um, prepare a waiver for the um, SUDS. Okay, and I can't remember, I can't. Anyway, so it was, it was the uh, institute institutions of mental disease uh, designation for facilities that were larger than 16 beds. And then that, of course, makes them ineligible for medical assistance. And that's a huge uh, deal for a lot of uh, facilities in, in the state, maybe as many as 60. Um, I understand the waiver is prepared, and now you need to actually give authorization to send the waiver to the federal government. That would be a good thing for you to do sooner rather than later waiting for the omnibus bill. It, it's something that you could just send in now. You know, three or four months um, getting it in earlier is three or four months that we, earlier that we might get the provision. I will turn it over. Um, thank you. It to Renee for the rest of it. And Commissioner, if there's any breath, time left, you. I'll yeah. talk some more. But there won't be, but thank you. It's, uh, we always love to hear more from you. <laughs> I cut and cut and cut. No, I appreciate it. That's what the county commissioners always say. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the committee. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My last name will probably take up just the amount of time I have left. I'm Renee Fraundienst. I'm the Public Health Division Director for Stearns County. And I'm here for the um, Local Public Health Association, LPHA, and the Minnesota Intercounty Association, known as MICA. Um, we would like to highlight three areas in the governor's budget um, that are important to public health. Um, the local public health grant, uh, which is the top priority for LPHA and MICA. Um, and it's the main uh, investment in the, by the state in the local public health system and services that are mandated in state statute. We've had a number of cuts in the past um, and this year, um, LPHA, in order for us to restore our capacity uh, to meet these mandated services and better respond to our state priorities, are um, advocating a significant increase in the grant. You've heard about home visiting, and I won't go into that. I will do that times two. Um, and then the last piece is we always appreciate the governor's final commitment or their, their commitment to ship. Um, this is a, a great program. It's statewide. It's in all 87 counties um, and the 10 um, tribes. And actually, these are locally driven strategies. Um, the community comes together to make a change. So we appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate you coming and getting all that information in a short time. Thank you. Mr. Bird, welcome. And Ms. Leonard is on deck. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Josh Berg, Director of Program Services at Accessible Space, Inc., and City Council Member for the City of Elko Newmarket. Uh, if anyone would love to visit our awesome little town down in Scott County, uh, let me know, and I'd be happy to give, give you a tour myself. But I'm here to talk about uh, this in relation to my role at ASI. Uh, ASI is a nonprofit organization founded in 1978 and is based here in St. Paul. The mission of ASI is to provide accessible, afforded, affordable, assisted, supported, and independent living opportunities for individual, individuals with physical disabilities and brain injuries, as well as seniors. We currently have over 150 properties in 31 states serving thousands of individuals. As I was preparing for this testimony, I kept asking myself which angle I wanted to go with. I went back and forth after re-watching the hearings on YouTube and going through the 452 pages last night laying in bed um, and, and kind of figured I would. It, it was a good read. Yeah. Um, but while it was difficult to hear about all the struggles DHS is having uh, related to providing the services across the state, whether it's down in St. Peter, up in Anoka, uh, or Moose Lake, or, or in the 200 or so group homes uh, spread all around, and man, do I empathize and understand uh, very clearly the struggles that they are facing because we, along with many, many other providers, are working through the very same issues. I'm not gonna sit here and ask for rate increases or what the state is going to do for me or us, but what I will do and confidently insist on is that all of these proposals, while most are actually pretty good uh, and necessary, I will ask that if and when uh, they are considered, that you consider whether or not they should apply to not only just DHS run or state run uh, facilities and that we've perhaps reached a point where we need some massive, significant, profound and impactful reform and actual change is required. Uh, you are at a point where change is possible. There's an opportunity and an energy and a desire to truly change the direction we are heading down. Uh, I have been told recently by an assistant commissioner of DHS that we providers and the associations that often represent us are only good at one thing when it comes to legislation, and that's killing stuff and not letting it go through. So I'm here to hopefully change that and to work collaboratively with you guys, with, with the, the state, um, so that we can figure out a way to um, stabilize everything across the board. You know, I can go into the, the, all the money we're going to lose with the rates uh, changing over the next couple of years. But again, I'm not here to do that. I'm here to, to encourage you all to be bold, be courageous, and take advantage of the newer generation of us with our na 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 naiveness and blissful optimism and sometimes ignorance, and combine that with the knowledge and experience of those who have seen and who have been a part of the progress we've made over the past few years. Let's stop with the patchwork approach, and let's roll up our sleeves and do this. I'm, thank you for your time, and uh, I look forward to getting to know you more, and you'll see more of me, too. Thank you for the encouragement. I appreciate it. And thank you for indulging me on the camera. I've been wanting to get up here and testify for the last few years, so I had to actually document it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's perfect. Uh, Dr. Stark on deck. Welcome to the committee. All right. My name is Mary Lennertz. I'm the Vice President of Services at LifeWorks, as well as the Chair of the Government Affairs Committee for MORE, which is a statewide association of 105-day employment providers across the state. 
Thank you for the opportunity to speak briefly with you. Um, there are many positive things in the governor's budget, um, including the statewide study regarding the transportation and expanding that for all citizens, including people with disabilities. That is a good move. You know, transportation is key to helping people live ordinary lives in the community. Um, we also appreciate the individual budget model for people um, with the disability waiver because the more um, they have clarity of the resources available, the more that they can request and receive flexible and individualized services and supports that bring quality. Also, um, we appreciate the work that it acknowledges will take place for the home and community-based settings rule and what it will take to come into compliance. We know that financial resources will be necessary to ensure that the process is strategic planned and does not impede services for people with disability. Also, we um, thank you for the three new employment services legislation and part of the budget. That is a great to add more services and add more that's very important to our members. I also wanted to highlight a couple areas of concern that we have. The first is the licensing fee increase. Um, we know licensing is important to ensuring quality services, but for example, at LifeWorks where I work, I'm, our 2016 fees were $12,000. Under this governor's proposal, it'll be $81,600. That's a 508% increase. Um, so we have a huge concern about that. Um, we also have concerns about the elimination of part day billing at RISE, another one of the more providers. They have been able to look at all their 2016 part day bill rates and convert it to what it would be in the proposal of the governor and it would result in $95,000 less in revenue for that provider. Um, and finally, the last concern is that the governor's budget does not include a rate increase to address the workforce crisis that we're working in. Um, you know, as providers of disability services, we compete with businesses that pay more money for jobs that have less responsibility and no personal care. It really is a crisis. So we look forward to working with you on the Best Life Alliance um, legislation because that addresses that issue. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Yep. Uh, Ms. George, you're on deck. Welcome, Dr. Stark. Um, good afternoon. Um, I'm Dr. Tricia Stark. I'm a licensed psychologist representing the Minnesota Psychological Association. And thanks for this opportunity. And I'm just going to touch on a couple of things. Um, the 5% increase in MA outpatient mental health fee for service payments would be really important <laughs> to help maintain access for clients. Um, as a provider organization, we have concerns about the repeal of the sunset of the provider tax. However, we recognize these are challenging times and we want to support quality coverage and care for all Minnesotans. Um, but we hope that the health care access fund is, is used for health care. Um, some other items that other people might not talk about, I want to talk about the CMS 9010 funding for health information exchange services for integrated health partnerships. Um, this will allow us to, to use electronic mechanisms to use alerts. And finally, we'll get, make some real progress in our ability to do care coordination and integration. It's also crucial to, to fund the development of the electronic health record system for the state's direct care and treatment. Only 20% of these programs are currently electronic and community partners need to have access to this important information to improve the quality and efficiency of care for Minnesotans. And I don't know if this is off topic, but on a personal note, as one of the 100,000 Minnesotans struggling to get coverage in the individual insurance market, I would very much appreciate the opportunity to purchase Minnesota Care coverage next year, as it would provide um, needed benefits for mental health services that just aren't available otherwise. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. On deck, Mr. Horowitz. Welcome, Ms. George. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Mary Jo George with AARP Minnesota. On behalf of our members, we want to thank you for um, the opportunity to testify. 
In general, ERP does support um, the department and the governor's vision to help older Minnesotans live in their homes and communities. However, we do believe the budget does uh, require some additional further investments and reform. First, I wanted to highlight that we support the return to the community program. Um, this program works with older Minnesotans who are either living in a nursing home and want to return to their home or they're at risk of nursing home placement. While this program is very modest, it, we think it will have a, a big impact on saving our state money. Unfortunately, um, our ERP long-term care cards that shows that we are ranked number one overall in our long-term services and supports show that we are ranked 30th in um, the number of low-need individuals in nursing homes that could otherwise be served in the community. So we think this is a very important program. The other issue that we wanted to uh, lend our support for uh, that you may not have heard uh, much about is the increased staffing for the Office of Facility Complaints to better protect vulnerable adults. We appreciate that the department has acknowledged that they want to do a better job of getting back to people on the number of maltreatment and increasing number of maltreatment complaints that they are receiving. Uh, we do hear uh, at ERP um, from families about their concern that, and frustration that they don't get back from the department. And I just want to share with you one uh, story of a, a family member who called me last week who believed her father was not getting proper care in a nursing facility. And unfortunately, because of se severe infections that had not been cared for, her father lost both of his legs uh, below his knee. So we think that uh, additional funding can really help uh, uh, the department respond to these. Of course, lastly, I just want to say that we do support a quality uh, long-term workforce and we support the uh, efforts to fund the PCA uh, program, but this doesn't serve all uh, individuals or workers, and so we would like to see investments in that, but we also know that they will come with needed reforms. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Vandenbue, and uh, welcome to the community. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Ben Horowitz. I'm a policy advocate for the Minnesota Budget Project. I'm also here on behalf of the Kids Can't Wait Coalition. The Minnesota Budget Project is an initiative of the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits that identifies and promotes public policies to expand opportunity and economic security to all Minnesotans. Because of the importance of reliable, affordable child care to family economic security, we're proud to be a member of the Kids Can't Wait Coalition. As a coalition of family child care providers, child care centers, nonprofit child care providers, and advocates for children and families, we were glad to see an investment in affordable child care through the Child Care Assistance Program, or CCAP, in the governor's budget. These investments would make three important changes. They would make child care assistance work better for families and providers. They'd update provider rates and improve choices for families. And they would bring Minnesota into compliance with federal rules. We were especially glad to see many of the changes proposed in the budget change item titled Child Care Assistance Program Improvements. These important policy updates represented a first step in updating our low provider rates, rates that make it difficult for families across the state to find child care. Additionally, many of these CCAP improvements would make the program simpler for providers, support parents' ability to succeed at work, and encourage consistency of care in stable, nurturing environments for kids. Some would make important changes for particularly vulnerable populations, like the provisions dealing with homeless families. The adoption of these improvements is important to bring Minnesota into compliance with federal rules, which is not an end in itself, but failure to comply with those rules on the block grant that funds CCAP could result in the loss of federal funds, which would only add to an already growing wait list for access to CCAP. On that note, Kids Can't Wait encourages the legislature to build on these investments by funding an increase for the families on the wait list in basic sliding fee. We've all heard a lot about that wait list. I think it's also important to note that about 3,700 fewer families are able to find affordable care through basic sliding fee compared to 2003. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, and uh, Ms. Man Warren, and welcome. Chair Abler, members of the committee, my name is Corey Vandenberg from Oak Grove in Anoka County. For the last 11 years as a PCA, I have cared for the critically needs children my family has adopted or taken in as foster children. I'm also an executive board member of SEIU Healthcare Minnesota, which represents self-directed home care workers. Please support the governor's budget proposal to invest $48 million with another $48 million in federal matching funds to increase wage and benefits for over 50,000 home care workers, including 27,000 self-directed workers covered by the SEIU contract. 
I would like to thank the bipartisan members of the legislature who co-authored our previous contract bills or who voted for it as part of the final budget cycle. The elder elderly and disabled prefer the dignity of their own home. As a PCA, I have helped my foster and adopted siblings with complex physical and emotional problems live in a home with a family that loves and cares for them. Home care is also good for taxpayers because it is a less expensive option. However, due to low wages, we have a crisis level workforce shortage, especially in greater Minnesota. This rate increase of a little more than 3% will fund wages and benefits for workers in our SEIU bargaining unit, but also for providers outside of our contract. In the traditional PCA program, private agencies hire and supervise the worker for the client. For workers we represent in the self-directed programs, clients hire their own workers. The rate increase will pay for a number of improvements. The minimum wage will increase from $11 to $13 an hour. There's also a 10% rate increase for clients with complex care needs. A new voluntary online matching registry will make it easier for clients to find willing workers in their area. Training opportunities are also expanded and paid time off accrues more quickly. Finally, no worker will be required to join SEIU or pay any fees. Employees who work in home care like me are paid an hourly wage, not as sometimes as it's referred a subsidy. Some like me join SEIU and put our money into our union just as some people choose to tithe to a church. Explicit language in the contract gives clients the right to provide higher page pay and benefits. The contract makes clear a client's right to direct their own care, plus hire and fire any caregiver. Though we have a lot further to go for our clients, the new contract will help alleviate the dire workforce shortage and improve the quality of care for seniors, disabled, and the veterans in our community. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, and sorry about the R in your last name. <laughs> um, and Mr. Vogel, you're on deck, welcome. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Julie Man Warren, and I'm the CEO of Living Well Disability Services, a not-for-profit that was founded in 1972 as Dakota's Children. It was a 48-bed residence for children with significant medical and cognitive disabilities. Their parents needed an option that was close to home and in which they could engage. In 2001, we closed that facility and opened nine group homes, transitioning individuals into smaller homes and neighborhoods and from state institutions into our homes. Today, we support 300 individuals with disabilities in one of our 33 homes in their own apartment or in their family home. Our services are available to individuals with disabilities living in 10 counties, and those are listed in front of you. Please let me tell you just a little bit about our workforce. We employ approximately 234 full-time equivalents and 185 part-time part -time employees. Between them, they have 3,600 years of tenure. They do this work because they love the people that we support. However, we better compensation for direct care workers who support people with disabilities in home and community-based services is critical to stabilizing our essential services for Minnesotans with disabilities. Our overall rate of turnover right now is 38%, which is significantly less than what you heard from uh, the statewide average. But that means, but we also have openings, 84 direct care openings currently in our business that we're not able to recruit and retain employees for. That causes a huge cost to the state of Minnesota and to our organization. We are extremely disappointed to see that the governor's budget did not include a rate increase for home and community-based services in his proposed budget. The rate afforded by the current rate system is not only not competitive with other businesses in Minnesota, which we are increasingly competing with Walmart rather than others in our field, but it's not, uh, com it's not competitive with comparable jobs in similar industries. A wage increase for direct support professionals would go a long way toward recruiting and retaining the hardworking quality employees that Minnesotans with disabilities deserve and that we try to train and keep. 
thank you very much for your time. And I do want to give you a, a small parting gift in that the last two speakers from Living Well Disability Services, while they had important things to share with you, will not be sharing those today, but will come at a future date. Well, thank you very much, and thanks for your good work. Thank you. On deck is Ms. Erickson. Uh, Mr. Fogel, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Ethan Vogel. I'm a legislative representative for AFSCME Council 5. Uh, AFSCME Council 5 urges the committee to consider and then support the investments in direct care and treatment. At the Minnesota Security Hospital, we've had too many workers um, who have been seriously injured by patients, and getting hurt is not part of their job description. This investment will help reduce injuries over time and turnover, and it'll help to expand evaluations and treatment for the, patient, for the patients. Mr. Chair, you could fully fund this proposal and the staff to patient ratio at MSH would still be lower than uh, facilities in other states, similar facilities in other states. And so we would not be jeopardizing our shared goal of efficiency in public services. Sure. Uh, AFSCME also supports the governor's request for additional funding for the Child and Adolescent Behavioral Health Services Program in Wilmer. Uh, the proposal to expand community prep services at Minnesota Sex Offender Program, um, the proposal to adequately fund MSOCs, the Minnesota State Operated Community Services, and the upgrades to the security and monitoring within direct care and treatment. We also support the governor's proposal to invest significantly in our children by uh, improving the child care assistance program. And finally, we support funding for an operating adjustment to the department. It's very important. One thing not included in the governor's budget, which we believe this committee ought to seriously consider, is increasing funding to counties to hire, train, and retain additional child protection workers. Um, the commissioner recently stated that the number of accepted maltreatment reports is up 72% from 2012 to 2016. Um, and this increase is being felt by the folks doing the child protection screening, investigations, and case management. And though additional funding uh, was recently provided, it was not enough to make the caseloads manageable. And when child protection workers have too many cases, they regularly work uh, off the clock, and they often do not have a, enough time to adequately address the unique needs of individual cases. Uh, so increased state funding is needed to address the surge in the accepted maltreatment reports. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members, for your time. Thank you, Mr. Fogel. And uh, Ms. Regan's on deck. Welcome. Welcome, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman and committee. My name is Sarah Erickson. I'm here on behalf of CORI, which is the Coalition of Recovery Investment. And we're a group of individuals and, um, um, and groups that work in the area and advocate for chemical dependency changes. Uh, we are really excited that the governor included the substance use disorder continu continuum of care redesign. It's on page 177 of his budget. Many of you might know it as the SUD waiver, which Commissioner Higgins uh, briefly referenced. Um, the waiver itself is being worked on right now at the department and will be submitted to you um, all for your approval. Hopefully it will streamline the process for accessing treatment. It will help with withdrawal management services across the state. It'll pro provide for better care coordination and it will also address the IMD issue, which I know many of you have heard of over the last 18 months. We haven't seen the language yet for the department, but we're really excited to continue to work with them and we're excited to bring that language before you guys for your final approval so we can submit the waiver to CMS. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, on deck uh, is uh, Ms. Tuck. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and Committee. My name is Mary Regan. I'm the Executive Director of Aspire Minnesota. We were formerly known as the Minnesota Council of Child Caring Agencies, so I'm happy to 